good afternoon everyone uh, so i welcome you to the online event digitize and standardize the construction process so following is the uh, program details so we'll start with the audience poll and then chakrish sir will give the welcome note then we'll have mr daljeet singh director of works of dmrc to uh, make a presentation then mr andy butterfield from bsi and mr nimesh gupta uh, then we'll uh, disc have the q and a session in the end so i request everyone to please uh, write your question in the q and a box in advance whenever you uh, the question clicks you you should mention the question in the q and a box so later in the end i'll pick up the question and uh, ask the uh, relevant speaker and then we'll end by vote of thanks by chakre sir okay so uh, starting on so i'll uh, quickly uh, launch a poll so i would request everyone to please uh, participate in the audience poll so it will help us to set the tone of the event second uh shweta can you uh, make me the host yeah thank you okay so i'm launching the poll the poll will be open for uh, 30 seconds so i've launched the poll so the question is the participants background so whether you are a design consultant engineering consultant construction professional or from the other profession so i request everyone to please uh, participate in this poll so we'll get the idea about the composition of the participants so i'll end this poll in 10 seconds uh 10987654321 thank you i'm just ending the poll so i'll share the uh, results so 26% are design consultants only 15% are engineering consultants and uh, majorly it's the construction professionals who are part of this 33% and other 26% are from the other profession so i am uh, stopping the results thank you everyone for participating okay now moving on uh, i would like to invite uh, chakre sir so mr jain is the chairman of board at capricot technologies private limited and he did architecture from iit kharagpur and started his autocad training and consultancy just after the graduation so i would request sir to please uh, take over and start your uh, give the welcome note yeah thank you farad uh, let me know when i can share my screen okay thank you yeah my screen is visible yes sir yeah thank you so first of all i like to thank mr daljeet singh mr andy and mr nimish to uh, so gracefully uh, accepted to share their thoughts around standardization it's something which i personally feel is the critical need of the r and uh, the kind of uh, press, uh, uh, pressure we have in the construction industry to improve the construction industry without standardization it can't be done so i'll i'll not take much time i'll like to have all our esteem industry speakers to talk more about what they are doing in this so i'll just take few slides on about ourselves so as capricot we have been into this industry now for more than 30 years and helping all the professionals specifically in the construction industry to use the technology and today we are serving more than 20000 esteem customers like yourself across the country from 10 different locations and we have a team size of about 
250 uh, employees. So we are Autodesk partner and we do provide all the relevant solutions from Autodesk and we are headed by a board of four members. And uh, apart from Autodesk, we also felt that there are some gaps which are there in solutions. And so we also tied up with the relevant other companies like Adobe, uh, Trimble, and we bring those solutions to all our uh, customers also. And we also have are now recently part of RIB group of companies for construction solutions. So coming to the current today's theme uh, on digitization and standardization. Now, this is a chart probably everyone in the construction industry has seen that the productivity in the construction industry has been going down. And although I might be sounding repeating on this chart, but I think this is one very critical chart. We all as a professional in the construction industry need to worry about and think about. And, and it's only us who, who can improve the industry. We, and what we need to do is that we need to think that how can we improve? And for that, we know that without standardization of people, processes, and tools, we'll not be able to improve the productivity. And that's where, of course, we know there are a lot of strategies which we'll have to adopt to be able to do that around people. How do we know their skills? How do we know their knowledge level? How do we improve the processes? And what are the tools which we do? And of course, today in the industry, IPD, lean construction, and BIM is the uh, buzzword today. And everyone is trying to improve that. But it is something which cont continuously evolves based on our need. And that's what we need to focus on and uh, bring on that. So this is one question I am leaving for all the speakers that how do we improve the productivity in the construction industry? And second challenge, which I like to also uh, present of the construction industry is the diversity. It's been recognized fact that construction industry is the most diverse industry. There are so many different stakeholders which gets involved in delivering a project. And therefore, how do we exchange the information between all the diverse uh, stakeholders? And for that, what is been now referred as common data environment becomes very critical. So what are our strategies around exchanging the information? Again, a lot of standardization then have to be done around that is another issue which we have to deal with as in the construction industry profile. So without taking much time, I just wanted to leave some few high level, very high level thoughts. And with that, I'll hand over back to Farhat. Uh, thank you, sir. So I'll uh, just reshare my screen. Okay. So I would, so uh, our uh, first speaker is Mr. Daljeet Singh. So Mr. Daljeet Singh presently working as director works, one of the key top management position in DMRC. He has already served 31 years in construction sector, out of which 20 years in execution of metro, underground, and elevated works. He completed his BTEC degree in civil engineering from IIT BHU and MTech from IIT Kanpur. He was involved in successful planning, design, and construction of underground metro corridor in Delhi from Central Secretariat to Vishwavidyale, 11 kilometer of Delhi Metro Phase 1 project during 98 to 2004 using tunnel boring machine first time in india in urban environment so over to you uh, dalji sir um, thank you mr chakreshian uh, good afternoon to everybody uh, the topic chosen for this webinar is most appropriate i can say the digitize and standardize the construction process what I have observed for the last 10 years, a lot of improvement has taken in the field of digitization and standardization for the construction process. But the pace is slightly slow in India. I'm talking about especially the India. Now, in the last one year, due to pandemic situation, this the crisis which has occurred now most of the construction industries have converted this crisis into their opportunities just by accelerating their digitization and standardization. We, we at DMRC also 
utilize this crisis and converted this into opportunity by accelerating our digitization program using beam technology in our phase force as you must be knowing or just for your information we are running 390 kilometer of metro one of this seventh largest in in the world network and during the last 22 years of journey starting from 98 till 21 especially in the construction we have used with the 2d concept though we were last of three or four years and thinking that we should now use the beam which are most prevalent in the other part of the world and because we are faced a lot of problems while executing the three phases phase one two three what we have noticed when we are executing through 2d a lot of variations on account of making this boq based on 2d the combined services drawing which we are making in in 2d have a lot of clashes which has resulted into a lot of infructuous works and end of the day there is a loss of time and for of course the actions on time the money we had to give to the contractors and end of the day it is a national wastage i can say and we were knowing that the tool is available and since we are not familiar with this tool we wanted to do to the but we are not familiar with this tool then when we are completing this phase three then we decided in 1918 that we should now really work hard on switching over to from 2d to 3d that by using the beam technology but problem was then we have our construction process we don't want to suddenly over night change the beam where we are just a, not knowing abcd i can say that way though people were knowing but we as a as a company in work we are we don't want to disturb our ecosystem in construction ecosystem the, then we had presentation from these different stakeholders in this industry like the auto desk the bentley and the of course i can say the mr chakresh jain capricot he was i have personally called him and he has made a n number of presentation uh, he has given the nuances of the bim how common data environment is being bait it is cost effective because we have seen in we are consulted a different part of the country where the work was going on we were not able to appreciate how immediately we can translate into our the work culture then through their different discussion what we come to know that we had to first and foremost we had to make a common data data environment using two or three the softwares there are different players in this making software now problem again arises that interoperability problem is going to be happen then since we are used to with this 2d 3d auto autocad 2d 3d civil 3d work and we thought of that way we can start with autodesk their product and make a common data environment program now is in phase 3 what you have seen i am just ma making how the construction process which was happening till date in phase 3 most of the our contract was based on epc we used to engage detailed design consultant initially who in term used to give us 2d drawings the boq the specs the tender drawings and based on the tenders ddc has to give the concept plan for my stations and the alignment once concept plans are finalized after taking the inputs from the different stakeholders 
we convert into 2D and accordingly the BOQ and standard documents are made. Tenders are floated. Contractor scope was to just make this structural drawing based on this GADs and combined services drawing. Again, the problem I told the construction process, the weaknesses, the lot of variation was taking place. The class rejection was there. Infectious work was taking place. In phase four, keeping with the same construction process, we don't want to suddenly change from the, our experience construction process. We only targeted where we really has to undertake that work instead of going in the sea change. We uh, foremost, first and foremost, we DDC, we put a condition in DDC that they had to make the, the, the 2D concept into 3D concept. Means conception has to be given in the 3D using BIM technology. And uh, with the discussion with the different stakeholders like the civil architectural, the EN and the air conditioning, the signaling, the telecom, the different stakeholders are involved, take the inputs and we make the architectural BIM model, the ENM BIM model, and we combine it and make a integrated BIM model. And we will reach where there is a zero class dejection. Once this class dejection becomes zero, we put into tender. Similar condition we put into the contractor also. He has to uh, use the BIM technology and the everything will be available through the DDC and they have to develop their BIM, structural BIM model using the concept plan which was will, will be given by the DDC. This is the, I can say the departure we have made. We don't want to change from the other. And in this, Capricot, we have engaged officially for making a common data environment. I think that was a, I can say that the great achievement that Capricot has given a helping hand. They have undertaken, we have undertaken, I think somewhere 300, 400 people training under them. I think in Green Park somewhere, their office is there. They are imparted the training. We engaged some model, uh, BIM modeler, who was again that taught us how to take care of, because in our, in our house, in DMRC, even the DDC and the contractor, they were not knowing, though they were also doing on, on a piecemeal basis, but not doing it in, in their houses. As a result, things were not comfortably. Then we insisted that they had to engage the BIM modelers who was best experience. What I have come across in India is still we have lacking in the BIM modelers. We hardly any, very few people are there's exposure to this BIM model. With this help of this BIM modeler, we were now able to achieve this the common data environment. And once this common data environment was made, I think most of the problem was taken care of. What we have observed when we awarded the work to the contractor, since they are used to be the 2D concept, they don't want to immediately switch over to 3D because uh, slightly they were a hitch, I can say, because they were also not conversant. We insisted and they strict the guidelines. We told we cannot accept anything in 2D concept. You have to submit everything in 3D. They agreed and the making of BIM model for the structural part, they have given, started giving without any fail. What now I am observing the last, I think one year, I can say that what I have seen during the pandemic, even the drawings, which was we were issuing in the 2D concept and all what has to be signed. Now we have switched over to digitally signed drawings and no 
I can say the physical drawings are issued now DMRC. Everything is now in virtually. It has to be signed virtually. I think still some hiccups are there, but I am sure that with this pace, what we are absorbing within six to seven months, everything will be streamlined. And even now on regular basis, now DDC has my DDC means detailed design consultant has started giving us the integrated BIM model, which are we are keep on updating by taking the inputs from the different stakeholders, like my ENM path, architectural, the air conditioning, and same work we are conveying to the contractors who again based on their structural part, they are updating that part. This way we are what I finding this is working smoothly. Next, we are going to integrate this BIM 3D, upgrade it to 4D and 5D. For this 4D, we have again developed PMIMS, means Project Integrated Monitoring System that is going to give the real-time progress of the work. And we are thinking with this um, BIM model so that the, the progress is, we are going to give on real basis. And the later pass once will be, I can say that experience, then all we can switch over to 5D. Otherwise we don't want to, in the haste to convert in 5D and land into the problem. I can just, tell to my construction industries and the all consultants who are listening to me that my request that they should immediately switch over to the BIM technology. It has a n number of, I can say the advantage, just I mentioned what we have faced right from making the BOQ speed of construction, the clashes, you name anything that you can just rely the ones you used to with this. Just you have to open one BIM cell where you can engage the good BIM models, give impart training, and just try one and you will be successful that way. This is my request to all my that's all. Thank you, Mr. Chakravarty. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for all that encouragement you have provided and we know Met Delhi Metro especially has been iconic in changing the construction in the country in fact your impact has been so big contribution has been so big in the construction and I'm sure with this next step what you have presented today it will encourage all other uh, professionals associated with construction to take that effort and start using leveraging technology thank you very much sir for thank you Farhad, you would like to ask some questions? You have some questions for sir? Uh, uh, thank you, Daljeet, sir. So uh, there are a few questions. So I would just, uh, I think there's one question from uh, Miss Mona. So she's asking that how far down the construction chain does BIM go in India? There are many construction workers who are not computer literate. So how is this hurdle handled? Uh, what I experienced, this has to be tickle from top to bottom. It cannot be from bottom to top. If the management top has the will, he can translate from 2D to 3D immediately. Otherwise, this process is going to be very, very slow. Because the same way the computerization has happened, initially it was very slow, but later part, once we are tested, people have to now very used to the same the technology I can say if will is there from top it can be translated and I'm request as I mentioned that they had to engage the good beam modeler once you have suppose engaged your will is there now to be immediately the will has to be there to engage a good beam modeler because we don't have any good beam modeler in the country this has to be now engaged in that way. And good people also should be now in the, this industry for in the BIM model, because right now nobody is choosing, very few people are choosing this BIM model. Maybe that the 
those were the big uh, projects they are used to with but the smaller smaller things people are not used to whether there are lot of interfaces are involved this is my message thank you thank you sir so um so i would uh, like to invite uh, next mr andy butterfield so as a managing director for the global build environment at bsi mr andy is responsible for coordinating the global vision and strategy to enable a safer sustainable resilient build environment he works with and supports colleagues and teams around the world operating across bsi stream of knowledge solutions assurance consultancy services and regulatory services working in collaboration with industry stakeholders and clients mr andy drives innovation and product development activities to support new developments in the market including the adoption of digital transformation acceleration of smart city initiatives and the circular economy so over over to you mr andy thank you very much for the introduction uh, farhad if i could just ask you to load my slides please that would be great uh, uh, yes sir thank you um just to say uh, i'm delighted to have been invited to to join you all this afternoon and um and thank you for that kind introduction uh, farhad uh, as farhad has explained Um, my role is managing director of the built environment sector at uh, BSI, uh, and in usual years um, that involves extensive amounts of travel to our global offices to to host events such as this, and also meet our clients and discuss their industry challenges. Um, so I think we've all agreed, really, that the last year has been anything other than uh, a, a typical year. so at least i can join you uh, virtually through through the conference um what i want to do today is really just take you through our bim journey and what bsi has been doing uh over the last few years really to help with the global implement, uh, implementation of of bim um before i start i love the phrase earlier that mr jan uh, had in in one of his slides which talked about unleashing new ideas i thought that was wonderful phrase to to hear um, and i'm going to talk really i think if we consider what my role uh, in terms of communicating today how bsi's help it, it it's put very simply it's how to help unleash great ideas to succeed is probably a, a, a simple way of putting it but if i could just ask for the next slide please farhad just to explain um before i talk about in particular bim and built environment i just thought i would share with you um a bit about bsi um we're best known really as the uk's national standards body and indeed we were the world's first uh, national standards body but our portfolio and services extend far beyond just writing standards and supporting the standards uh, development process um we have uh two other business areas um that are we we would particularly busy with uh in the respect of the built environment the first being our assurance business which really if we capture what our assurance business does is it's it's the it's our role in assurance to help transfer the knowledge that's enshrined in the standards that are developed and help educate the market educate clients through training to achieve um certification and uh, and and this has been a very key uh, area for BSI over the last few years with BIM in that we've designed training courses to help transfer that knowledge in the BIM standards and also have worked across the world uh with different organizations um throughout the supply chain um to 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 help organizations demonstrate the successful implementation of those bim standards and the other part of our business is our consultancy services business now as you will appreciate because we're the national standards body we have very strict um structure um 
around uh, our, our governance because we operate under under Royal Charter, which essentially sets out you know, the terms of, of our governance. Next slide, please, Farhad. Just talk a little a bit about what we do and why we do it and our, our purpose. Well, our purpose, as you can see here, is actually to inspire trust for a more resilient world. But what that means is, in real terms, we work for the public good to improve, standardise and simplify business systems, products and services. All of our profit is reinvested back into uh, to BSI. We don't have shareholders, so there's no distribution of that, that profit. Um, and as such, we're completely independent from any outside influence and are able to work to constantly serve industry by reinvesting those, those, those profits back into the organisation. A lot of our work, as you can probably tell from our, our purpose statement, is focused upon helping organisations to become new, more resilient. And uh, given the changes in circumstances that we've seen globally over the last year and a half, you know, our work in this area of helping organisations to survive and adapt to sudden change, to then stabilise, rebuild and ultimately become more resilient has never been more critical or relevant. Next slide, please, Farhad. Next slide, please, Farhad. Great, thanks. So before I talk about what we've been doing with BIM, sorry, if we can skip that one slide. Um, I think it's really important that um, I communicate really where our journey started and what we do in very simple terms. So here you can see a picture of 1901. Um, and this is really relevant to BSI because this is where our journey began. And what this picture shows is radical transformation and innovation, or to use the term that Mr. Yang, uh, Jane used earlier, this was unleashing of a great idea. However, unleashing great ideas needs to be done in a coordinated and structured way where everybody in the supply chain collaborates and coordinates together to achieve the outcomes that that innovation is, is looking to achieve. And back in 1901, you know, this, this was a huge project to move from horse-drawn carriage to tram, tram rails and, and tram networks in, in our cities. But the problem was that in unleashing that great idea, there were 75 in excess of 75 different sections of steel that made the process of innovation impossible. And this is where our founder convened the first standards committee and working together in collaboration, they actually developed the world's first standard. What that actually meant is that those steel sections reduced from 75 to around six. And innovation was able then to, to accelerate and the outcomes were achieved. So put in very simple terms, when I'm asked, well, what does BSI do? It's really simple. We help to solve industry challenges by engineering solutions through collaboration. And that's as relevant now, today, when we look at BIM and the challenges as it was to our Victorian cousins back in 1901, trying to drive radical innovation back then. Next slide, please, Farhad. So if I fast track, 120 years, because we celebrate BSI 120 year birthday uh, this year. So today, what does that mean for the built environment? Well, what it means is that through knowledge and standards and assurance, what we help to do is drive a safer, a more digitally enabled and ultimately sustainable built environment. And actually our global footprint now is considerably more significant than it was back in 1901 with 84,000 clients in 193 countries that use over 190 different solutions to deliver services in the built environment. And to put that into context of standards, that represents over currently 3,000 current construction standards that are available. And our clients represent uh, 
51% of the top 100 uh, global construction companies use us for our assurance services. And you'll see some of those clients uh, in, the, in the presentation shortly. Next slide, please, Farhad. So I've talked about our work uh, in the respect of the UK's national standards body, but what's important to consider is the vital role that we play in supporting international organizations and standards uh, bodies across the world. And you can see some of these detailed here. We work extensively with European committees, CEN, CENELEC, ETSI, IEC for uh, Electronic uh, Electro, uh, Technical Commission and ITU. We also were founding members, we're very proud to be one of the founding members of the International Standards Organization. And in the bottom of this slide, you can see reference to PAS standards and Agile standards. And this is the service that BSI provides where there, there's a, a challenge in the, or a problem in the marketplace, but there's, there's, there's not yet a standard in existence. What we're able to do is develop quite quickly standards that help solve that problem and help industry meet that challenge. And this was very much our journey for BIM. Um, what started initially in the UK with developing a series of what we call uh, PAS or publicly available specifications has paved the way for ISO and where we are today with a whole series of international uh, standards for successful BIM. Uh, next slide, please, Farhad. Just to give you an idea how broad uh, the standards landscape is uh, and how extensive our work is across the built environment. You can see here simple visual of all the different areas where we support the built environment sector, whether this be in relation to health and safety or fire, to construction products. We're very active looking at, at how to achieve a more sustainable built environment. And increasingly over the last few years, our work in enabling digital transformation has been quite significant, um, particularly around smart cities and in this respect, BIM. Next slide, please. So really what I want to do on the next two slides is tell two halves of the BSI story is the way I always uh, explain how we've helped with, with uh, with, with global implementation of BIM. So we consider the two halves of the story and actually the, the story is, you know, solving industry challenges, engineering solutions through collaboration. Chapter one would be creation of a standard. So looking at this slide, if we work through, BSI, our first place to support industry is always around solving an industry challenge or addressing a problem in industry. This is where the journey starts for BSI. What we then do is we embark on a highly collaborative process and a very inclusive process of trying to address what that industry challenge is. And to do this, we develop stakeholder communities. And from this, we have committee drafting um, panels that work together, uh, bring together experts in a particular field to understand what the challenges are and to discuss and agree a form of standard. The draft standard is then put out for public consultation. All the comments are reviewed from interested stakeholders. And when consensus is reached, a standard is published and we provide ongoing support uh, in the adoption of that standard. So in the case of BIM, what this represented was a challenge. The challenge in the case of BIM was really how do you create a system whereby you can harness the new technology that was being used through building information modeling to achieve the outcomes. So that actually there was coordination. We managed to achieve coordination of extensive supply chains and collaboration. Back, back then, when we were discussing the, the, the challenge initially, it was with UK government, who then funded the development of PAS 1192-2, which was 
at the, stat, the, the first standard for looking at BIM uh, in, uh, in the construction phase. But the challenge is here is developing a standard is only half of the story. If we go on to the next slide, what we actually have been really busy globally over the last few years, and I've personally um, led the, 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 the global BIM project at BSI, it's been my privilege to lead our teams and work with our teams, um, it is in the adoption of that standard. Because if a standard exists, but no one's using it, then actually what we haven't done is we haven't achieved what we set out to achieve, which is better outcomes, reduced waste, increased efficiency, all the, all the different areas which you've just heard from the speaker before, Mr. Singh, the, the benefits of using this technology. And one way to do this was to take the standard and follow exactly the same highly collaborative process in developing a global certification scheme. So we followed exactly the same process, bringing together community stakeholders to discuss what good would look like in implementing BIM standards and, uh, and what a, a kite mark scheme could help organizations demonstrate. And we did this together, agreed consensus, and then we held a pilot and we launched the kite mark globally back in 2015. And ever since then, we've been helping different countries adopt the best practice in the standards. Um, and now in particular, as those standards have become ISOs, the marketplace has opened up and is using BIM standards at a far, uh, a far more extensive uh, scale than they were previously. Next slide, please. Just to put this in the context of the BIM standards, along the top of the slide here, you can see where BSI really sort of led the standards development. Um, yeah, yeah, so BS 1192, information uh, sharing, um, common data environment standard, then PAS 1192-2 to support design and construction. And then as we move through, um, PAS 1192-3 um, covered asset management, and we also uh, issued standards for information security and uh, for health and safety. And what's been happening in parallel is, as I said, we've been working with ISO to support the development of ISO standards to support BIM implementation. As you can see along the bottom row there, in uh, 2018, we saw the first of those ISO standards um, published with uh, ISO 19650-1 and dash two published. And then last year, the publication of, of uh, parts three and parts five. So we've worked extensively with ISO to take the best practice that we built in those PAS standards and, and use that to develop it, uh, more international standards. Next slide, please, Farhan. So our journey on enabling organizations to demonstrate this best practice globally has been quite extensive. And you can see here a limited snapshot. It's, uh, this, this is not the logos of all 300 clients. Um, however, it gives you an idea of the breadth and the scale of our work in supporting organizations to really embed a best practice that's enshrined in, in those BIM standards and to, to really achieve differentiation, to showcase how they, they're using those standards to, to bring about better outcomes. So very proud now that we have over 300 clients and that's in 24 different countries who, uh, who have adopted our certification services. Next slide, please, Farhad. Now, one important point when you consider BIM and in particular BIM certification is that you need to design something that can be used right across the breadth of the supply chain. So we've been working with representatives and organizations across each, each of those different tiers within the supply chain. And you can see a very yeah, simplified model here with three different levels. So our work has extended to working with government departments and the appointing parties, clients who award the contract. It's naturally then been very extensive with working with lead appointed parties and tier one organizations the world over who look to bid to secure those contracts being awarded by clients. And then ultimately, 
down in through the supply chain. All of those organizations, architects, MEP consultants, SMEs that work in synergy with lead appointed parties to deliver the project to the client. And this has been our approach from the outset to ensure that we design solutions that are suitable for each tier of that supply chain. Next slide, please, Farhan. So as I sort of draw to a close, one of the, I just want to leave you with an important principle, I think, here, uh, that we, we, we all need to consider. It is BIM, BIM has helped really re revolutionize how construction has been undertaken globally. And, and I think we all know um, that within the built environment sector, an increased pace of innovation is really, is really needed. And BIM represents one of those leaps in, in innovation. However, as with all innovation, uh, and if I look at things from a BIM perspective, collaboration is absolutely the foundation for BIM to succeed. Whether this be in organizations developing a cohesive strategy, whether it be those organizations actually implementing processes so that they can achieve the, the improved outcomes through using BIM. And actually technology becomes the platform. What's actually happened in BIM is the advances in uh, technology have enabled collaboration at a level that was previously unachievable through sharing of information and data. Next slide, please. One of my roles uh, working with the team at BSI over the last few years has been to really help showcase excellence in the built environment. And it's been, uh, it, it's been my privilege really to meet so many clients and host so many events across the world where we've been celebrating the achievements uh, of organizations. These are just a few photographs really. If I, I take the big photograph there, uh, that, that was a, an event we hosted in London. The, that was actually the launch of the, the big pipe mark for BSI with a very sort of proud bunch of uh, organizations being awarded for the world's first kite mark certification. Um, top left, um, it was in the Netherlands where we were celebrating a rather large uh, European construction organization and achieving their, their kite mark certification. And then the bottom left, this was, uh, this was working with the, a, a government department in Dubai who liked the concept of the BSI kite mark so much, they were the world's first government institution or organization to actually adopt the kite mark themselves. And they felt that was helping them send a powerful message to their supply chain partners in that, that they, they wanted to be shown to, to lead by, by example. So it was great to work with the Road and Transportation Authority of Dubai. And to this day, we continue to work closely with them as an authority in Dubai. Next slide, please. So what we realize that at BSI is, is BIM, like any innovation, is a continuing journey. And there are many organizations on the different stage of that journey. So what we have done is we've developed a very clear pathway to help organizations, irrespective of where they are on that, that journey. So by making available, BIM standards, developing BIM standards, that creates a great starting point for organizations to understand what they need to do. We then provide a suite of training services that help organizations really understand how do they implement those standards? What do they need to do? And then finally, where an organization you know, is at a level of maturity, where it, like, it would like to showcase its achievements, we're able to offer uh, certification to really demonstrate what best practice looks like. Final slide, please. So I've taken you through 20 minutes thereabouts of 120 years of BSI history and really put into, into context our role in supporting BIM implementation. So just a thank you from me uh, for being invited to speak today. It's been my honor to join, join the, the, the panel today. And I very much hope the presentation was helpful in understanding the role that standards play in helping innovation within 
the built environment and in particular BIM to succeed. Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Randy, for uh, giving us the overview of BSI standards. So obviously this uh, has given a clear focus to our viewers that when you, they are on a mission to standardize their construction processes, so where they need to go, what to refer. So I'm sure they're going to use this information and definitely aim to standardize their construction process. So thank you, Mr. Andy. So I'll move on to next. Okay, so our uh, next speaker is uh, Mr. Nimish Gupta. So Mr. Nimish is a serial entrepreneur, a business leader, policy influencer, and an impact maker. He was most recently managing director South Asia for RICS. As MD at RICS, Mr. Nimish successfully managed the turnaround of the business and influenced multiple policy decisions with government regulators and policymakers, some of which could possibly have a path bringing impact on the sector in the time to come. Mr. Nimish has been well-respected business leader with over 25 years of experience in built environment, education, learning, and technology adoption with the last 18 years at MD, and CEO level. Uh, so over to you, uh, Nimesh, sir. Thank you, Farad. Am I audible? Uh, yes, sir. All right. Uh, sorry, apologies. Uh, uh, I would actually be switching off my video from mainly two perspectives. One, I'm sitting in the hospital, and secondly, I'm on a mobile network. So that will suck a bit of my bandwidth, uh, but I'll try and make sure that I make the most of it, uh, despite not being visible to all of you. So I hope that's all right. Uh, yes, sir. No problem, sir. Something wrong. Okay, I'm trying to share my screen, uh, Farhad. Unfortunately, my Zoom has frozen for some reason. Okay, so we can hear you clearly. Yeah, but I'm unable to share my screen. That is the problem. What I'll do for us, I'll quickly rejoin. Right, sir, right, sir. So meanwhile, uh, Mr. Nimish is rejoining. So I would request uh, my viewers, participants to keep posting your questions in the Q&A box because after uh, Nimish sir finishes, so we'll have a quick uh, Q&A session. And uh, if we are not able to answer all the questions, then we'll- I will, uh, I will accept those questions, Farad. They are very interesting sir. questions. So right, sir. Uh, it goes up in my session itself. Right, sir. Uh, so I'll just share my screen. Yes, sir. I hope you all are able to see my. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So, discussing around and and I, we heard some stories around BIM and uh, and it was so heartening to know that DMRC as an entity is trying to move into a direction which is much needed for most of the construction entities, especially of the scale of operations which DMRC has. This was a welcome change, which was much needed. Yes, it has come in phase four, but it is uh, better late than never. And possibly setting examples for others also to follow. So in terms of digital transformation, while we focus a lot on BIM today, 
I really want to basically reflect upon what is a digital transformation of the uh, built environment means for us, what's needed in this case, and what is impeded, and that's more important. We'll we'll quickly talk about that. So as we all know, uh, the industry, and I'm sure this has become more of a jargon also now. At the same time, it is getting embedded in our in, uh, veins and arteries uh, with the in, uh, with the with the influence which COVID has had on our working processes. That the industry is fast moving towards Industry 4.0, from an absolutely mechanical production to an assembly line approach to computers and IT circuits. We are now talking about more embedded technologies interconnected technologies and mass connectivity and making sure that data plays a huge role in all of that. So if I talk about industry 4.0, with data analytics at the core of it, which is where uh, we are looking at it is digitization and integration of supply chain, uh, making sure that your business models are becoming more and more digital and the products and service offerings are also getting uh, uh, completely digitized. We are talking about all equipment, all connected things which are getting digitized, whether these are mobile devices, IoT, I'm sure most of you know what we are talking about, location detection, uh, location detection technologies, especially uh, with most of the people having the uh, mobiles in their hands and they're effectively using it for their social media profiles, I'm sure most of you would be able to correlate to this. What I need to basically draw focus upon of the audience over here is looking at advanced human machine interfaces, looking at authentications and fraud detection, looking at 3D printing or additive manufacturing, looking at smart center, uh, smart sensors, looking at big data analytics and advanced algorithms, looking at multi-level customer interaction and customer profiling and augmented reality and wearables. We have seen sporadic examples of this in the world. And before I start lamenting what is happening in, in our country, let me also tell you, I had posed this challenge to the industry roughly about 10 years ago. Can there be a site? Can there be a site which will be devoid of physical labor and which will be working completely on connected technology? Uh, I'm sorry to say we still haven't come across a single site in the world which has been able to boast of uh, uh, being a completely faceless approach when I say faceless, yes, you may have still equipment operator, but I don't want to see, uh, if I say that uh, I don't want to see a labor on site, that has not been the case. If I try and uh, translate industry 4.0 to construction 4.0, and there is a reason why I'm actually emphasizing on this, because for me, digital transformation of built environment will not happen unless we look at construction 4.0, unless we go uh, beyond BIM and understand that paradigm which basically is trying to link the cyber physical systems, uh, the data uh, to the digital layer of BIM and CDE, the physical layer, which consists of the asset over its whole life and interconnected environment, integrating organization processes and information to efficiently design, construct and operate assets. Today, we are still talking about design and construct only. We still haven't thought about operating assets and I'm sure when Mr. Dalji Singh was talking about benefits of BIM, there is a huge benefit of BIM, which they would actually be able to exercise upon in operating their assets, which are going to last for another 150 years, maybe, or even more. Uh, so what is it? What does it use? So we'll try and talk about what does construction 4.0 means for us. If I try and simply talk about it in three layers, the first one is digital layer, wherein we are talking about digital twin being created uh, we have all discussed build, building information modeling. We have talked about common data environment, which uh, Dalji sir uh, uh, kindly talked about. Uh, one of the most important thing to make sure that this digital layer is being able to talk to the digital tools, whether these are cloud-based approach, AR, VR, artificial intelligence. Now, all of these things, while it still might appear to you, oh, I have heard these words, these are jargons, this and that, but guys, let's understand. This is the new world. This is when you say new normal, a new normal is not forced just due to COVID. I think we need to open up our eyes and see that these are important technologies for us to try and make sure when Chakresh said that the construction productivity is going down, it is only going down because we still believe that we are yet to handle technology in a way. We are yet to come out of our traditional practices. And I'm going to talk about those impediments later on. But 
linking those digital tools with some of those things which we are looking at, whether these are worker sensors, and there are a few sites which we have uh, which we have seen. Uh, incidentally, ten years ago, I have used worker sensors and sensors to try and do uh, snag management and control systems uh, in Dubai. But again, sporadic examples have they become a trend? Have they become an adopted technology across the industry? Not yet. So let's try and understand. What do we need to get these transformations effected? The first and foremost is around product transformation. And if you try and correlate to the supply chain over here, or if I try and correlate to uh, the evolution of what is happening in the construction industry, I hate to say we are still there at the bottom of the pile. We still haven't moved to modular construction. While we have seen some sporadic example, as I said, and uh, Mr. Daljeet did uh, reflect on some of those things, whether it was modular or offsite construction and industrialized construction also. But we are yet to see robotic assembly. We are yet to see additive manufacturing becoming a practice in the world. We are yet to see uh, product transformation happening across uh, the industry. We are still very well engaged in a manual process. We still see scaffolds which are made out of bamboos. We still see a process which is basically still archaic. We still see hand buggies going for and delivering concrete on site. Where are we with respect to this supply chain evolution? If I talk about delivery transformation, and we did mention uh, that the transformation should go into the supply chain. And when I am talking about supply chain, are we moving up from transactional approach to a lean delivery approach, wherein we are we are incorporating the complete life cycle management? whole of asset into our thought process. We're still looking at initial capital cost and that thought process is reflecting in our enable, uh, our inability to transform digitally, our inability to adopt technology in our construction processes. And when I'm talking about digital transformation uh, from a non-model based to model based, we're still to get into a complete cyber physical integration with digital technologies in construction industry. As I said, I'm yet to see a project in the world which has worked with a complete seamless manner of all these layers being put together in one single project. So if I try and talk about simplistically, and I'm sure most of you have seen this uh, exciting news about the world's highest bow uh, string gutter bridge, an arch bridge constructed on Chenab River, uh, which is I think roughly about 370 meter high. And I'm not sure if someone has uh, read the data over there or read the fine prints. It does briefly talk about the benefit of using BIM technologies, uh, uh, BIM approach to the construction of it. Now, that place, which is extremely complicated, using prefabrication, using BIM as a layer, using technology to deliver it, we have been able to basically showcase an approach which goes from uh, a 3D geology survey to prefabrication to just-in-time delivery to making sure that it is being done on time. So there are huge cost, time, and quality advantages. I'm sure most of you who have seen the pictures, uh, we have seen uh, the steel construction coming off age, and I'm sure most of you would know. Um, in India, we have had appalling quality of construction, especially when I talk about uh, steel uh, construction. We haven't seen that quality construction, but when you see that Chenab River Bridge, you know that technology has played a huge role in trying to build something which will again last forever and will be a medal uh, in India's construction uh, uh, portfolio. So what have been the impediments? Um, and uh, I have deliberately kept very less slides, but impediments, and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to think it's slightly controversial over here. But it is important that we call a spade a spade while we are talking about this. What have been the impediments for us to digitally transform? And I say it is fear of unknown. And if I try and decipher what is that unknown? So from you, it is understanding or lack of it. What do we understand, first of all, by digital transformation? Is it just moving from uh, uh, hard copy drawings to a 2D and then to a 3D and then BIM? And this is a very interesting question which Mona has asked in her Q&A. Mona has asked, I think if I read her question, which is a beautiful one, uh, just a second, I'll just take out her question. Well, she was possibly talking about uh, a, a question which says, where does the BIM supply chain or BIM knowledge goes into the entire supply chain? 
Mona, a better and a pertinent question to ask in this case, where does the BIM start in India? I mean, is, has it started in client's mind right now? We have very few examples. We have very less progressive clients like DMRC who have been able to mandate uh, uh, BIM as a, as, a, as a thought process, BIM as a philosophy in their entire supply chain. They have made sure, and I, it was so heartening to hear this from Mr. Daljeet Singh, that they have made everyone in the supply chain come to a common data environment and make sure that everyone was adopting BIM as a process and in, in, uh, in their deliveries. So understanding or lack of it, uh, which is the biggest factor over here. The second one, no mandate, no standards, no global alignment. So when I say no mandate, no mandate is by the clients, clients who have uh, not been able to mandate because they have their own reluctance. They have their own fear of unknown. They have their own uh, uh, practice led approach, which they believe, oh, I've been doing this for seven decades and this is how I know, this is how it works. Not willing to adopt technology, and while uh, we did hear from Andy wherein he talked about some of those global standards, I'm still yet to see translation of that. And when I say translation, it literally does not mean Andy uh, um, translating it from English into Hindi, but translating into our work practices and translating into uh, from BSI into BIS. We just need to change one letter from BSI into BIS. But is that something which Bureau of Indian Standards is looking up to to make sure that some of these standards which are from across the supply chain, whether it is skills, whether it is competencies to as good as BIM standards or interoperability standards or whole life cycle management standards or correlating it with IEC also, that's not there. And when I say no global alignments, it actually transcends boundary beyond India. It does say, while we are talking about uh, some of these standards being adopted in India, there, we are yet to see global alignment on some of these digital transformation uh, practices being aligned globally. I'm sure with what BSI is working on, which Andy's team is working upon, along with ISO, uh, they already have it in their agenda to make sure that they are able to see the future and make sure that they continue working on it and make sure that it's a one common language which is adopted by everyone in the built environment sector. Uh, but this is where I think the challenge remains more so in India because we are still, while we are aligned in our IT practices with the global world, advancements in the global world, our construction process are painfully archaic, painfully slow, painfully pedantic in terms of their approach to adopting some of these. Uh, uh, so the, they're, they're still very pedantic in terms of adopting their uh, traditional practices. K stands for knowledge gap. Knowledge gap, uh, again, uh, whether I call it voluntary knowledge gap or involuntary, the knowledge gap remains. And more than that, what pains me a lot that the approach of, of our industry leaders to try and make sure that this knowledge gap is being fulfilled through a proper learning and development management program wherein they can transform their entire organization. I was so uh, delighted to hear uh, Mr. Daljeet talking about their 430 odd people getting trained by Chakresh and his team so that they will be able to, how many people try and take that pain of getting their entire supply chain trained in a process because that's the need of the art. That's the way you are. Uh, some of those uh, um, uh, benchmarks in the industry. The next one is the worst one. There is no appetite for tech adoption. Barring one or two clients, uh, there has been a complete apathy towards adopting tech in built environment. Uh, if I go to construction, if I go to infrastructure, there are not many companies in India who can do pure design and build. And when I say pure design and build, that's where the opportunity lies for basically making sure that they are able to adopt technology across the supply chain, making sure that it finally delivers the results. Uh, the next one is opportunity versus cost. So my question is, is it about initial cost only? When, when you say that people, you are supposed to invest in technology, most of the clients deter from investing into technology because uh, they feel that the initial investment is not going to recover their overall cost. No, it's not the case. If you are able to put in a system, if you're able to put in, uh, if you're able to adopt technology, 
if you are able to and just for a simple example uh, there are few uh, and and a student of mine is developing a, a productivity platform uh, a complete project management platform he is trying to make sure that the money which is being spent on this is recovered in a day on, on within a month itself by a proper monitoring system through the tech platform which is trying to create that tech platform will ensure that there is a complete digital project management practices which are being put into place so it is never about initial cost it is about having a vision to make sure that you are able to see the opportunity versus the cost w basically stands for the wishful thinking around traditional practices why why i say wishful thinking because people their reluctance to move away from traditional practices makes them think and believe that these traditional practices will continue to help them give dividends they'll be able to continue delivering those they'll be able to they'll they'll continue to deliver the product despite construction productivity falling they able they will be able to continue delivering the same quality and safety parameters despite the fact that the skill level of our construction people are going down significantly the number of people who belong to the construction industry or are trying to basically pursue a career in the construction industry is not increasing at the rate uh, at which this country is growing so that's where i think that wishful thinking is actually a bane um, uh, for the industry last but not the least which is again one of my favorite topics is no skills competencies and professional outlook uh, sorry there is a t missing there uh, but these skills and competencies not being there uh, which are not defined in our standards which is not defined by our bis also uh, that is actually creating a bigger hurdle and a bigger impediment for the overall development because we still we, we continue to have those people who possibly do not have complete knowledge of uh, what should happen in the overall supply chain but we are happy to get one of our engineers pour concrete uh, for let's say a 30 cubic meter pour without getting worried about how do i make sure that the integration of services ha has happened uh, on there so that's being the so i'll possibly try and talk about my last slide over here the big question is and which is where i would want each one of you to think through with with the world changing so fast there is an equation which is getting developed uh, there is a there is a thought process which is getting developed what is what is a balance between human versus robots now how do i make sure that human at this point of time are able to manage the processes and manage the robots also to make sure that they eventually deliver what is what is that what is the that the human wants them to deliver are we able to see the future now uh, so that is a bigger question at this moment let's rise from the ashes of our traditional practices practices let's rise from poor construction practices let's rise above from some of those uh, construction productivity chart uh, chart which chakresh showed me it pains me a lot uh, when rest of the industries are going up we we only see that the construction productivity is falling it's a time for all of us including the clients and i do see uh, i i do believe if we can have more of mr daljeet singh in various clients businesses i think we are going to have a beautiful uh, construction industry which is going to bring about a paradigm shift in how infrastructure is seen in the country so with that i will uh, finish my uh, presentation i'm more than happy to take questions there was one more question which had come in and i'll quickly take that farhad before you jump into a formal q and a session that question was around uh, i think uh, uh, are, is there a time frame uh, is there a time equation which is more skewed in a 2d drawing versus beam drawing now i do want to and this was an anonymous guy so i will actually want to reflect upon this yes there might you might think that the process involved in changing a beam model might slightly be cumbersome because you will have to basically go into the beam model change the model then uh, make sure that the drawings are produced and then the drawings go to the site but look at this if those changes in a 2d drawing are not coordinated very well then you will end up spending possibly 1000 times more time in correcting that on site than correcting that on your pc so that is the beauty of virtual construction if you are able to virtually construct it you are able to pictureize it so that you take a uh, fortune or or destiny out of the picture make sure that it is more predictable with that i'll possibly come to an end and uh, take up any question and answers which might be specifically targeted at me or something which farad you would want me to handle
uh, thank you, sir. So we'll uh, move uh, to the Q&A session. Uh, so before that, uh, like, thank you for touching upon the roadblocks of uh, the BIM implementation, or, or I would rather say the process processes in the construction industry. And I'm sure the leaders present in the audience would make a note of that and try to leverage the power of systems, the power of process to make the construction projects more efficient, save time, save money, improve quality. So, uh, uh, one, so before we move on, I want to just um, share uh, two training programs that will take only a few minutes. So like J Daljeet sir mentioned, so we helped uh, DMRC to implement BIM and uh, we conducted a lot of uh, training programs for them. So uh, this is one of the training program which we offer. This is BIM for design. So this is for the design professionals and it's for individual professionals basically approximately it takes three months and we cover all the um, important tools required for a project delivery based on uh, BIM process. And uh, for training inquiry, you can write at connect at capricot.com. Similarly, uh, we have Capricot BIM Guru. So this is for the corporate, this is for the organizations. If they, as an organization, they want to switch over to BIM. So we have come up with this one year contract which includes training plus troubleshooting hours, plus we provide a lot of Revit content for faster uh, adoption of uh, BIM. So again, for this, uh, for the inquiry of BIM Guru, you can write email to connect at capricot.com. So now we'll move on to the uh, Q&A session. So I'll just uh, read out a few uh, relevant questions and uh, then, um, and I, I also saw that uh, there was some request for the recording of the webinar. So you guys can uh, write a request at connected capricot.com. We'll send you the link for the recording. So, um, so there's one question uh, from Mr. Umesh. So I think uh, Nimish sir can answer that. Is there any proper BIM workflow for uh, structural design? If so, what will be that solution and how to integrate that one? So while Chakresh might also jump in, I I firmly believe, and I'm sure Andy would also be able to reflect upon it because it is a question related to standards. There are defined workflows, uh, properly defined workflows for each of the disciplines. Uh, so structure, structure is no different. I I hundred percent believe that structure is no different in this case. So, Andy, would you want to take that up uh, with respect to specific uh, areas on the structural workflows? Um, yeah, I mean, rather than talk about specific workflows and content of the standard, just to pick up on your point, Nimesh, that absolutely within within the standards there are procedures and processes for for workflows, as there are for structure in a common data environment. And my only suggestion would be probably the best place to, to, to sort of pick up is probably offline to have a detailed conversation and understand more about the standards content. But absolutely, you know, th those standards have been designed um, to, to include, you know, how, how, uh, how workflows will be managed. Yeah, ISO 19650, I think that is the place to look up to. And I'm sure when you connect to Andy, Andy will be able to help you directly as well. Thanks, Nimesh. Uh, thank you, sir. So uh, one question for uh, Mr. Andy. So this is from Mr. Anupam Banerjee. So is the certification available for the individual as well? This BIM certification? Process. Uh, uh, absolutely. So, just to pick up on on, on that question, Pied, I'd be happy to um, to 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 explain a little more about the certification process we have in place as part of our training suite. So, our, our certification process is not just aimed at, at organisations. Through our training, we're also able to provide an ongoing. Um, certification of, of individuals and their competency as well. So I'd be happy, more than happy to, to exchange details and, and connect on that to provide more information. 
right sir so then we um so there's one question i think it's common for all uh, what is the future of bim in highway projects it's from mr gorav pawar so chakresh would you want to take that yeah Or should i yeah nimish you can uh, first you can give your comments i'll add to that yeah so in terms of highway projects uh, i think this is one of the most laggard with respect to adoption of bim but i think the biggest benefits uh, uh, which would come out uh, from adoption of and when i say lagar we have used only elements of uh, uh, advanced technology or bim in parts of highway designing but we haven't used bim for asset management of roads now today when we are looking at roads these are roads which are toll roads they the asset needs to be maintained uh, the drivability the road conditions the maintainability making sure that the health of road furniture uh, is absolutely perfectly fine and all plus making sure that the infrastructure which has been put on to the road is it self sustaining over a period of time what is the life cycle cost of it i think those are the answers which road projects will get hugely benefited from if they start adopting bim processes uh, throughout from feasibility report till the time they are looking at complete asset management of it so just to add to nimish comment also on the design and the construction part and in fact nimish showed that in his that uh, bridge on river chenab that how right from survey to design and construction how they leverage the technology in executing this project and that's exactly has to be also done on all, all infrastructure projects and of course the good thing is today in infrastructure project like government has mandated lidar scan which itself is reducing lot of issues which i remember earlier used to happen that what the consultants have designed and when the contractor used to go and execute on the site they used to find huge variation in the original survey itself now with the lidar scanning all those issues have gone and therefore less litigation less change order so that itself is helping a lot and like that And without getting into too much of detail, but at each stage, the BIM work uh, processes are helping in cutting down all these kind of challenges. So it's definitely a very very critical piece, and the kind of infrastructure we are supposed to construct in the country, it's kind of like we must use it. Yeah, if I could just add my comments to say, from a from a UK perspective, it's clear the you know the the benefits of using BIM. For highways, as as it is being used extensively with all transportation uh, infrastructure projects, um, uh, picking up on the point earlier that that was 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 just made, actually, uh, one of the the key benefits of BIM is understanding all of the below surface infrastructure that surrounds uh, the motorways as well. And this is a huge advantage of BIM in being able to to understand over the lifespan of that asset, you know. What the what the maintenance requirements are and what is actually be below the surface of the motorway um, or, or or highway. Um, so we're seeing this used more and more, uh, and particularly with convergence as you start to look at smart infrastructure and things like smart motorways, far more technology is being you know used in the in in highway construction these days. So so uh, absolutely we are, we are seeing it used more and more. If I could just pick up the next question, just there's one there that from Anupam, um, just on behalf of BSI, just to say, you know, uh, through myself and the BSI India team, we're, we're absolutely in India. You know, we're we're a global organisation, so you do have, um, you know, a, an organisation within India that can help with understanding the standards, can help with the training, and ultimately with with uh, BIM certification. So please, again, let's exchange details um, because we are able to help within BSI India. We're here to to help with in that regard. Thanks, Vard. I just thought I'd pick that one up because it was clearly BSI or standards body related. Thank you, sir. So uh, I would pick one more question. Uh, it's from Mr. Shubham. So this question is around what's our take on the artificial intelligence and 
BIM, common data environment, construction, design. So he's asking, is it possible? Well, it is very much possible. As I said, if you looked at that industry 4.2 framework, uh, wherein I, I still, when um, I did detail about the construction 4.2 framework, AI will play a very important role. But Shubham, let's begin with the basics first. Let's adopt intelligence before we adopt artificial intelligence. We are yet to adopt intelligence uh, with respect to BIM, common data environment, and for that matter, even common sense in terms of making sure that we, we start thinking towards adopting technology first. And I'm sure artificial intelligence would actually be a significant game changer. Uh, but unless we, uh, so artificial intelligence is basically uh, an added um, additive on top of what we want to do in terms of making sure that our processes, our systems become far more sharper. But I think uh, th there is there is an uh, there is a, really a desperate requirement for the industry to start adopting technology as a whole, and look at uh, the digital transformation as a whole within the country and within their own organizations. Thank you, sir. So I would like to add uh, uh, on this by giving a very small example. If we talk about uh, artificial intelligence, we can use that to do the menial tasks. So like in BIM 360, BIM Collaborate Pro, we can actually compare this software comp compares the version automatically. So if you want to compare the R1 and R2 set, what are the changes in the two revised drawings? So automatically the software compares and tells the difference. So that saves a lot of time and also chances of error. So in small, small things also, we are already using the artificial intelligence. Like in Revit, we multiple people can work on the same model at the same time. So that is also artificial intelligence. So right now our AI is being used to do the small repetitive tasks uh, fast. So, um, so, then uh, I think we can move on to the uh, word of thanks session by Chakre, sir. So there is a, there are just one or two more questions. Yes, uh, Mohan yes, sir. Has asked how can we implement virtual construction management? So uh, Mohan, there are a lot of people who are trying to do it. And if you want to do it, uh, please uh, uh, reach out to one of my students, Nazim Siddiqui, who's trying to develop a platform known as Colab. Uh, Colab basically works on uh, construction uh, collaboration. So if you want to understand, uh, he has been able to integrate the entire pieces of technology uh, and uh, the platform is being built right now. Okay, so I think sir, okay. now because uh, we're already out of time, so we can now conclude. So I would request Chakre sir to please uh, Give a word of so first of all, I like to uh, uh, thank all the participants for giving us this opportunity to share our ideas. And uh, uh, although maybe we didn't plan, but the way the our webinar turned out to be like Mr. Daljit Singh initially shared what actually they are doing on the ground in the projects uh, using technology, and then Mr. Andy presented the standard that how we need to do it. <laughs> And then, of course, Nimish brought us to the ground by saying, what are you not, not yet doing it? So there's still a lot of ground to be covered and a lot of work to be done. Like that's what Nimish uh, kind of highlighted. So in a way, now we can see the spectrum that Nimish from academic and research background is showing what all we should be thinking about and what are the future problems we need to resolve. And Andy talking about the, how to standardize these things, whatever you're doing, how do we standardize so that we reduce the risk, we, re we ensure that things happen on time and bring the productivity. But for the people working on the ground have their own set of challenges, which also need to be looked at and resolved, like what uh, DM, a, a large organize, infrastructure organization who have to work in the most complex environment of urban infrastructure, how are they implementing? So I, with that, I like to thank all the panelists for sharing their thoughts and all the participants for coming and attending. Uh, thank you very much and do look forward to we will almost on weekly basis we are doing some tech technology focused webinar we look forward to attending you on those thank you thank you thank you sir thank you everyone have a good day thank you very much